Well, good morning. What a great prayer. It's our prayer this morning as we come to this time of dedication. And we're going to do something here at the beginning of of our sermon. Uh, Because we're celebrating on all three of our campuses today, all three of our campuses, through two campuses, three different worship venues right now at this moment, we just wanted you to kind of peek in kind of New Year's Day style to what's going on. There's rule preaching. Can we just tune in to rule preaching? You want to hear rule? I'm just kidding. Y'all got, y'all stuck with me. Y'all can't hear, just hear rule. All right, but there's rule preaching, and, and go to the St. Mark now. Go to St. Mark, what's happening. This is cool, in my opinion. We can see what's happening at St. Mark. There's their, the end of their traditional service, their 9 or 9.30, 9 o'clock traditional service. Bryce held them a little bit late. He takes after me. So there you go. There, but I think it's cool that we, we can kind of look across these couple of campuses and see that we're all celebrating today. We're all giving for the common cause of the kingdom of God. Y'all think that's cool? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Stephen. You may see Stephen come out a little bit here and there because other services will be peeking into this service a little bit. So uh, just pay no attention to the man with the computer, okay? So we're glad you're here with us this morning. It's a special day for us. I just want to start today by saying thank you. There's a lot of people to thank. We've come to the end of this Beyond initiative and this Beyond series, at least the the sermon series part of it. And I just want to say thank you to to the many, many leaders of this church and leaders of this campaign who have literally given months and months and hours and hours of meetings and blowing up balloons and putting dinners on and, and making some hard decisions. Just lots of people gave a lot of time. I just want to say thank you if you're a part of that. And also thank you to our communications team and our creative team who helped do all the stuff with this series. A lot of people put in a lot of hours. Again, again, we've been thinking about this. We've been working on it for a creative team for like six months now. <laughs> We're kind of glad it's done too, but excited for what, God, what God's going to do. And then finally, I just want to say thank you to you as a congregation. Thank you for sticking with, with us through this. Thank you for, for coming and hearing these sermons and, and, and this, this vision that we feel like God's given us and being a part of this. Just thank you. I'm grateful to be part of a church that's looking forward and that's moving forward. That's the part, kind of church that, that I want to be a part of. And you know, this is my first campaign like this to ever really be a part of and especially to preach. And, and so going through this initiative, going through this kind of process, There's been a lot of learning experiences for me, and God has really impressed upon my heart or or, or helped me remember a lot of things about about my faith with him and and what that means and what it means to take a step of faith. And so I just want to share that today. I just want to share some of the learnings that I've had about what it means to take a step of faith, learnings that I've come to through this beyond process. And and in order to do that, we're just going to be looking at a passage of scripture today where one of the most famous steps of faith took place. You heard it a little bit earlier that Jeremy read. Matthew chapter 14, if if you want to turn in your Bible with me or your smartphone to Matthew. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. A little past middle of your Bible, Matthew chapter 14, starting with verse 25. We're going to be taking a look at Peter's dramatic step of faith that we sung about earlier. You heard the message translation version of that earlier. And and in the midst of talking about that step of faith and what I've learned in taking a step of faith through this process, I'm also going to be working in uh, just a little recap of some of the things, the principles, the spiritual principles we've learned throughout this series, because I think they're applicable to us whether or not we're going through a campaign or not. I think they apply to us anytime. So I'm just going to kind of be recapping some of those. But here's what it says. Matthew 14, starting with verse 25. This is the real version, not the message version. You know, we don't, okay, that's a joke. That's a joke. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. First off, if you've never read the Bible, when you get to that part, you're like, he did what? Walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, which all of us would have been. Anybody seen anybody walking on the lake anytime soon, recently? No. You see somebody walking on the lake, and it's a little terrifying. They were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. You ever notice how Jesus has, like, just the right words? He doesn't have to give us paragraphs. He just gives us, like, a few words, a sentence or two. And we're like, okay, all right. 
don't be afraid, it's me. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water again. If you're reading this for the first time, I mean, a lot of us have heard this, but just put yourself back when you're first reading this. Walk on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped Jesus saying, truly you are the son of God. You know, sometimes I wonder why God requires faith from us. You know, why does he require faith? I, I can understand love, but why faith? Why doesn't he just show up and just make it to where we don't have to have faith? We just know that there's a God. I think he doesn't do that because if he did, there wouldn't be a choice in love. There would be no choice because we'd just say, oh, there is a God, we know it. And we wouldn't be able to choose him in love. But he's just revealed enough of himself, especially in Jesus, for us to know him and to choose him in love. And that's called faith. That's called faith, to know him and choose him in love. And so I just want to talk about some of the things that I've learned about that kind of faith in this Beyond series. And the first thing, and it comes straight from this passage, the first thing I've learned is that faith requires faith. Faith requires faith. Now, that may seem in, intuitive, you know, like no duh, but faith requires faith. Listen to verses 27 through 29. Again, Jesus is coming to them. He immediately said to them when they were scared, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Okay, then it's like a moment of truth for Peter. Jesus just said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Peter has one of those moments where his faith in Jesus actually requires him to have faith in Jesus. You know? Y'all don't know. Okay. Peter actually has one of those moments where his faith in Jesus actually requires him to have faith in Jesus. When, when his faith has to be activated and enacted and, and put into action where what he claims to believe gets tested and where the rubber meets the road for his faith and Jesus is like, it's me, I'm telling you to come. Are you gonna come? It's one of those moments. And the reason we struggle with those kind of moments, the reason I think a lot of us struggle in our faith is because that kind of faith, faith that actually gets lived out, it's risky because it involves the unknown. Now, it doesn't end up being risky if it's really God because God is behind it. We know God's in control. But, but there's the unknown element to it and it feels risky at, at, at the time. Do you think that Peter, that Jesus knew that Peter was gonna sink? I don't know. I don't know if Jesus knew that or not, but here's what I, I think Jesus knew. It was better for Peter's faith for him to get out of the boat regardless of whether or not he succeeded. It was better for his faith to take a step like that and, and actually be active than to, than to never have tried to do it at all, regardless of whether he succeeded or failed. For whatever reason, our default mode is to kind of fall back into comfort, to kind of fall back into the safety of the boat, which really isn't all that safe after all, because they were scared because the boat was being buffeted by the wind and the waves as well. It's really not that, not that safe, but we, we kind of go back to that and we get stuck in a rut in our faith. We get stuck in doing the same old stuff every time, every day. That's why a lot of Christians get disgruntled in their faith and they get disgruntled with the church a lot of times is because we're just stuck in that same old rut and we want something different. But before we move, we want God to guarantee us the results. We want guaranteed we, results. We want a definite voice. We want a sure plan. But what God wants is faith that gets exercised. See, in our faith, there comes a time for action. There comes a time where we have to act. Remember the story a couple weeks ago? We told you that it's in 1 Samuel 13 of Jonathan and his armor bearer. 
Jonathan and his armor bearer and the, the Israelite army who had kind of been winnowed down were in trouble. The enemy army was against them. They were way more than the Israelite army. The Israelite army had like two swords, literally. That's it. Amongst all the people. And so they were facing long odds. They were really scared. And, and, and they're kind of just shrinking back, shrinking back, shrinking back. And finally, Jonathan saw the king's son. Jonathan says, we got to do something. We got to act. And he says this. He kind of comes up with this plan. And then he says this to his armor bearer in 1 Samuel 13, 6. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. I think this is the kind of faith that God is looking for. Active faith. Faith that actually believes in a God bigger than we can imagine. Faith that actually lives out what it claims to believe. And I love that Jonathan said, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Because that's how, that's how my faith gets lived out a lot of times. I don't have a sure plan. I'll hear something or I'll sense that God is pulling us in some direction. And I'm like, okay, God, I think this is you. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. That's how I proposed to my wife. <laughs> that process right there. I prayed about it for about two weeks, gave God a deadline, said I need to know. But two weeks later, I, I said, you know what? I think this is God. I, I think this is what we should do. Uh, perhaps the Lord will act on my behalf. <laughs> and he did. Ten years later, we're good to go. That's how I decided to, to take this job. I felt like God was pour, pulling us in a certain direction. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. And all of a sudden, he confirms it right after that. That's how I make a lot of the decisions. I don't have this sure plan. I'm like, I think this is God. Let's take a step of faith and see. And you know what? When it's not God and I mess up and it's like, whoa, that was not God. Then I can look back and go, okay, that's not how God talks to me. And then when it is God, I look back and go, oh, God talks to me like that. And then the next time, I'm, I'm a little bit more sure when I take that step of faith, when I say perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. You know what? Regardless of whether I succeed or fail, you remember what the second part of 13.6 says? Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. So it doesn't really matter. If I mess up, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. If I, if I succeed, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. He's going to do. He can redeem. He can redeem, but he, he's waiting for us to take a step of faith. We, we kind of got to get out of our holes and give God a chance to act. That's what happened. After Jonathan said that, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Then they began to climb out of this little ravine they were in up the cliff and enact and, and their plan. They got out of their hole. 1 Samuel 13, 11, when they're climbing out of their hole, eventually to overtake the Philistine army, just really starting with the two of them, the Philistine said, look. The Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. I don't know if you remember when we preached the sermon, but it's an interesting little phrase there. And, it, and we, we kind of highlighted that it's time for us to climb out of our holes as Christians and take back the ground that we've let the enemy get. It's time for us to crawl out of our holes and be bold. Here's another thing I've learned during this Beyond series in light of that. Or God's helped me remember I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. Don't you want to see God do something larger than what he could have just done through just me or you? Don't you want to see God do something big? I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. That's what this, this initiative is. That's one of the things that it is. It's bigger than me. That's what the church is so good for. Us coming together and pooling our resources so that collectively we can do something that none of us individually could have done by ourselves. I want to be a part of something bigger. It, this process has been a challenging process for me and my faith. Any step of faith is a challenging process. I, my, really, my faith needed to be activated in a new way and challenged in a new way. And, and thinking about being a part of something bigger than myself and what I'm going to do to be a part of that has been a challenge and an activation 
for my faith to kind of, so that we've had to reexamine some priorities and shift some things around to be able to do what we felt like God was calling us to do, to get out of our comfortable, safe hole and give God a chance to act. And in order to do that, all we did was, and all we're asking anybody to do throughout the series was just look at what God's already given you to give. Remember the illustration? If you haven't seen it, you should go back and look at it. The illustration a couple of weeks ago of the dimes. Where they were pouring it. No one was here that week? That's cool. Uh, well, don't. Just go back and look at it. Get my views up. You know what I'm saying? On the, I'm just kidding. I'm just totally joking on that. But just go back and reexamine what God has already given you to give. Remember that story of the, the, the widow in 2 Kings 4? She's in trouble, and Elisha tells her to go ask her neighbors for empty jars. Here's what he says, actually. 2 Kings 4, 3 through 4. Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil, pour oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. You know what she did? She went and asked her neighbors for empty jars, even though she really needed full ones. She did that, and the oil didn't stop flowing until the jars stopped. Everybody pitched in. We have to be all in. But all she did was she just w- looked at what she already had. And God used that. And that's all we've asked people to do. Just look at what God's already given you to give. And, and bring your jars so that God can fill them. Just give God a chance to fill your jars. Faith requires faith. It requires action. And another thing I've learned is if we're going to activate our faith and exercise it like Jonathan did, like this woman in 2 Kings did, like Peter did when he stepped out of the boat, out of the boat when we do that, there's no such thing as just a step of faith. There's no such thing as just a step of faith or a small step of faith. Look at what happened to Peter when he stepped out in verse 30. He steps out, starts walking on the water, Verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. When he took that step of faith, it wasn't like any other step he had ever taken, was it? It was different, right? It was a different step than any other step he had ever taken because it was a step of faith. It was a step into the unknown. That's why there's no such thing as just just a step of faith or a small step of faith. Any step of faith is big and it requires all of us to take that step, all of ourselves to take that step because faith is dying to our old selves and becoming something new, something of who God wants us to be and who he's created us to be. And that's not a small thing. That's a big thing. John 12, 24, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That's what faith is. It's a dying to our old way of living so that we can live to God's way and be productive in God's kingdom. But that's why it's also so hard because we've gotten good at living that old way of living, that old way of thinking. When Peter took that step, it was a new way of thinking, wasn't it? We don't walk on the water. That's a new way of thinking. That's a new way of living. And there's new possibilities now for Peter, isn't there? That's the same thing for us. When we take a step of faith, any step of faith, whether it's the very first or or, or whether it's toward the end of our life, any step of faith is us putting aside ourselves, us stopping trusting ourselves and starting to trust Jesus more than we trust ourselves. That's hard. It was hard for my granddad to do. He was a self-made man, put himself through college, put himself through everything he ever did. All the money he made, he made it. That's what he would tell you. That's why he didn't come to the faith until much later in his life when things started to break down. It's kind of ironic to me that, that we just blindly follow the conventional wisdom of this world. It's ironic to me that, that people call Christianity blind faith. When we take a step of faith in, in the, into Christianity, into following God, people say, well, that's blind faith. If there's any such thing as blind faith, it's blindly trusting the world's wisdom over the wisdom of the one who created the world. That's blind faith. 
blindly trusting the wisdom of this world instead of trusting the wisdom of the one who created this world. That's what blind faith is. There's no such thing as just a step of faith or a small step of faith. Anytime we say yes to God, it's big. Whether it's the first time or the last time. And we become productive for his kingdom. We become good seed. Or another way of putting it that we've said in this, this series already, we become good soil. Good soul. God is looking for good soul to produce a harvest beyond our wildest dreams. That's, what ha that's what's happened here. Remember that, remember that verse in Matthew 13, 8? We talked about the very beginning of this series, Matthew 13, 8, in the message translation. Some seed fell on good earth, Jesus said, and produced a harvest beyond the farmer's wildest dreams. And that's what's happened here. God has produced a harvest beyond our wildest dreams, beyond what those original 31 people who founded this church 100 years ago could have ever thought because they were good soul. And that's what we want, we want to be as well. We want to be good soul. I know I say soul weird. I also say all weird, but that's, we were good soil. Okay. <laughs> Matthew 13, 23, I'll move on to the scripture. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. That's the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. When we hear the word and understand it, it sinks in to the depth of who we are and it makes a difference in how we live and how we walk and how we move and how we go about our life. That, that is when it, it produces a big harvest, even when times get tough. Isn't that the difference between the other sorts of soil and the, and, and, and the good soil is the, there's two other seed that sprung up. Remember the one seed sprung up, but it didn't really put down deep roots. And so when the sun came out, when things got really heated in life, it withered away. And then the other one sprouted up. It actually grew a little bit, but the, the thorns and the thistles and the weeds of, of life kind of wrapped around it and it withered away. Jesus said, those are the wealth and the riches and the distractions of this world. It withered away. The good soil produced the crop a hundred times as much. Even when times get tough. That, that pretty much sums up this campaign to me, <laughs> this initiative, when times get tough. I mean, we knew when we started this thing, when God was, we felt like God was calling us to this, that, you know, there's a sequester and we weren't in the best economic place, but we hoped that that would get better and it seemed to kind of be getting better a little bit. And we know that the private sector has been hurting for years and years and years. But we had no idea that a government shutdown, an impending debt crisis, and a tropical storm possibility would come in the weekend of our commitment. We could have never guessed that. There's tough times in life, and I know people are hurting. But that's why it's faith. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. We just have to obey and do what we think God is telling us to do. That's another thing I've learned during this campaign is in taking a step of faith, I can't worry about anything or anyone other than God. Really in ministry in general, I can't worry about anything else or anyone else except for what God wants me to do. God has called all of us to love him and to love others. He's called me to the same thing and he's called me to love you and live in community with you and lead here and teach here. And I love that. No matter what anybody thinks of me, I love that. Right? We, we, we have to do what God's telling us to do because God's the one in control. See, even when things are bad, God can redeem them. So why doubt? Why doubt? Listen to verse 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? You know, when I first read this verse, I get a little incredulous with Jesus. You know, I'm just kind of like, come on, Jesus, cut him a break, you know? This dude just walked on the water. I think he's doing pretty good. I think you should be praising him, not, not cutting him down, not getting on to him for not having faith. That's more faith than I've ever had. I'm kind of like, come on, Jesus. And 
until I read verse 32, it says, and they climbed into the boat and the wind died down. And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot. It's Jesus. Jesus was there. That's why he's a little frustrated or, or helping Peter out a little bit. Remember what he needs to be doing because when Jesus is there, the wind and the waves obey. When Jesus is there, why doubt? Why doubt? Jesus is in control. And he's there even when we're doubting. You know, when we first came up with our number for this campaign, I had a, a pit in the bottom of my stomach. <laughs> you know, like, okay. No, our number's not the biggest number ever, but it was significant for us. I'm like, okay, there's a little bit of doubt here. Anytime I uh, have that kind of doubt, I think about a story. When I first came back to Jesus, I was in College Station, Texas, and there was a college ministry there of about 6,000 students it's called Breakaway, and a guy named Greg Mott led it, and they had outgrown any place they had ever been. And they were looking for a new place. They couldn't find one. It was two weeks before the first service was supposed to happen, and they didn't know where they were going to meet, 6,000 of these college students. So finally, he got invited, or he kind of took a chance and, and went to the university and asked them. And they gave him half of Reed Arena, half of the, the basketball arena every Tuesday night to use. And he just, I remember him saying this. He said he was walking out of those doors and he's just saying to himself, why do I ever doubt? Why do we ever doubt? It's Jesus we're talking about. Have faith. Because when we have faith and our faith is greater than our doubt, it leads to worship. When we have faith and our faith overcomes our doubt, it leads to worship. Listen to verses 32 and 33 again. They climbed into the boat. The wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Even in Peter's lack of faith, even though he doubted, his faith, that step of faith combined with Jesus led other people to worship. It led other people to a deeper connection with God. And that's what we're all about here, connecting people to God, especially the people who aren't connected at all yet. What we believe is that God has put us, God has put Niceville UMC in a position of spiritual impact in regions beyond to connect people to Christ. Our, our theme verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 15 through 16, Paul says, we have confidence that as your faith grows, you will think enough of us to give us the help we need to carry out our assignment, spreading the good news in the regions far beyond you. We have a tremendous responsibility because of all we've been given here to, to do something with that, and to bless others, to, to use that to connect other people to Christ. Because we can because we have the resources, because we're blessed to be a blessing. One of the last things that I'll tell you that God has remind, reminded me of in this is that it's really not about me. It's really not. If there is a God like we believe in and if Jesus really is Jesus, and I don't have to doubt, <clears throat> then why not just do what he wants me to do and love other people like I love myself? That's what it calls me to. To bless them. It's really not about me. It's about God and it's about others. And he's just kind of reignited a passion in me that we need to be looking outward. And there's plenty of people in North Crestview. We've gone over all those numbers. You can look at them in the Connect Notes. There's... there's just about as many people in, in Crestview in the surrounding area who aren't really significantly connected to Christ than there is in Blue Water Bay, Niceville, and Valpy. It's ripe. Listen, I know what we're, we're about to do coming and laying our commitments here down at the altar. I know what we're about to do and what you've come prepared to do is a step of faith. There's no such thing as a small step of faith. It's just a step of faith. And I know it's hard right now because the wind and the waves of our culture are kind of battering us. The wind and waves of our economy are, are coming against us. But I also know that Jesus is still Jesus. 
and the faith that actually gets lived out and Christians who are willing to take a step of faith because he's calling us to it will lead others to come worship him as well. And let me just tell you, say this clearly. People will come to worship him through what we give. And I hope you, I hope you know, we, we don't want to pressure or guilt anybody. We're not about that. I hope no one in here has felt pressure or guilt from the church or from me. All we've asked you to do is get alone with God. Let him reexamine what he's given you to give and then do whatever he tells you to do. I think we need to be doing that all the time. That's all we've asked. And if he's told you to give something and you give here, people will come to worship him through what you give. I started this whole thing off by saying thank you and I just want to end it by saying thank you. Thank you again for sticking with us through this and coming along with us and being here. Thank you for letting me be a part of this body, the body of Christ. Thank you for what you've come to prepared to give. Thank you for hours volunteering and, and thank you for generosity even when we're not doing an initiative or a campaign. I just love this church. I'm so glad that God is calling us to move forward. Our God is so awesome and he's so good. He's calling us to come to him and take a step of faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you call us to you and that you're there for us. As we get prepared to give to you, just, just give us uh, faith to take this step. Thank you that you already have. Lord, bless, bless us as we come to give to you with just a sense of your presence here. We love you. We thank you for letting us get together and calling us to, to be per participants in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.